Many clinical research studies follow participants over an extended period of time until a specified clinical outcome is observed. The term survival analysis refers to a collection of statistical methods for analyzing data from such studies. Initially, these methods were developed when the outcome of interest was death, hence the word survival. Now, these methods are used more generally to encompass time until any event or until a collection of event. Some examples of survival data, also known as time to event data, include time until cardiovascular disease, time in remission, time until drug relapse, or time until death, stroke, or hospitalization. The material for this lecture was developed by Ian Brearley and Laura Lay at the University of Minnesota's Department of Biostatistics. I am presenting this lecture with their permission. To illustrate how we might create plots of survival data, consider the following simple example. Suppose you hatched a large number of mosquitoes in a container and measured how long they lived in days. You might draw a histogram of the percent who died each day as shown in the plot above. 25% of the mosquitoes died the first day, 5% died the second day, 20% died the third day, and so on. You may further wish to add a cumulative mortality curve to describe the cumulative proportion of death. This is shown in the bottom plot. The cumulative mortality is 25% on day 1, then 5% more giving 30% on day 2, then 20% more giving 50% on day 3, and so on until all mosquitoes have died. The cumulative percent dead is indicated by the black line. If you take the cumulative mortality curve and flip it upside down, you have the percent surviving for each of the passing days. This is a survival curve. In our simple example, none of the mosquitoes can escape our jar. The outcome for every mosquito is known and observed. The only possible outcome is death, and all eventually die. This example illustrates how to track survival, but only in cases when there is no censoring. In the setting of a clinical research study, that is unrealistic. Most often, we know the status of the majority of the participants, but other factors make determining the outcome and follow-up time for every participant unlikely. So what is censoring? First, we will define censoring and then describe what factors might lead to censored data. In clinical trials where the researchers are tracking the occurrence of an event across follow-up time, it is common for there to be incomplete information regarding some participant's health status. Censoring is statistical jargon for indicating that an event has not yet occurred on an individual up to a known time from enrollment. For example, suppose we are conducting a study investigating the outcome of death due to cardiovascular disease. In our simple example, we have four participants denoted on the vertical axes. Time from enrollment is indicated on the horizontal axes. Participant 1 is enrolled into the study at follow-up time 0 and followed until the occurrence of a cardiovascular disease death. This is marked with an X. We have full information on this participant. They had the primary endpoint. We know the date on which it occurred and they are therefore not censored. Participant 2 has no events during the study and continues being followed to the end of the study. We mark the last date on which it is known that no events have occurred with an O. This participant is subject to administrative censoring at the end of the study. Participant 3 is followed for some time in the study, but then is lost to follow up. For whatever reason, we have simply lost contact with them and do not know their status with regard to the primary endpoint. This person is considered censored due to loss to follow up on the last date this participant is known to have not had this event, marked here with an O. We have partial and incomplete data. We will want to use this data in the analysis and not just ignore it, because this person's partial information indicates some measure of success. We know that up to the point the participant was lost, this person had not had the outcome. Note that for the integrity of a study, 
missing data due to lost participants should be minimized. Finally, participant 4 died of an unrelated cause, let's suppose of cancer. This person is no longer at risk for CVD death and can no longer be followed. The cancer death is called a competing event. Death due to a non-CVD cause happened to occur before death from a CVD cause. This person is censored due to a competing event on the date of death, marked here with an O. Careful investigation must be done to be sure the intervention did not cause this adverse effect. After data collection by the investigative team, the Independent Data and Safety Monitoring Board should review the case. Censoring can lead to biased estimation of the survival time in a study population. For the example shown here, there are at least two incorrect ways to deal with the censored observations. The first, if we simply delete all censored observations, then we are discarding valid information about how effective the treatment was. Participant 2, for example, was successfully treated and lived until the end of the study. Deleting participant 2 from the study would make the estimated survival time too short. On the other hand, if we ignore the censoring completely and assume that all participants had the event of interest at the last known time, then we are also ignoring valid information about how effective the treatment was. Participant 3, for example, was lost to follow-up. So we know they lived at least that long without dying due to CBD, but we don't know how much longer they lived or what they eventually died of. If we count participant 3 as dying of CBD at the time they were lost to follow up, our estimate of the survival time will almost certainly be too short, possibly by a lot. One very common correct way to deal with censored observations is to calculate survival using the Kaplan-Meier method. This method uses all of the data available at a given time, including participants who eventually will be censored, to estimate the survival at that time. Let's work through an example to see how this method works. Consider the survival data shown above, where each time indicated shows an event, except the times with a plus sign, which indicate times where data were censored. Let's assume that the event of interest is death due to some disease and that the survival times are measured in years after disease diagnosis. The data indicate that three people died at year six and one person was censored, was lost to follow up, died of something else, or was administratively censored at the end of the study. One person died at year seven, one person died at year 10, one person survived to year 11, but was then censored, and so on. Let's work through the steps involved in the Kaplan-Meier method. First, we will calculate the survival at each time point, and then we will plot the survival function versus time, creating what is called a Kaplan-Meier plot. To begin with, we create a table as shown above. The first column lists the times, t, at which an event occurred. In this case, six years, seven years, 10 years, and so on. At study enrollment, t is equal to zero. The second column lists the number of people at risk, n, that is, the number of people who were still being followed a microsecond before the indicated event time. At time zero, study enrollment, there were 21 people at risk. The third column lists the number of deaths, d, at time t. At time zero, which is the time the person enrolled in the study, nobody had died yet, so d equals zero. The fourth column is the risk of death at time t, or in other words, the proportion of people at risk who died at that time, which is simply d divided by n. At time zero, the risk of death is zero deaths divided by 21 people at risk, or 0, 0.000. The fifth column is the risk of not dying at time t, or in other words, the risk of surviving. At time zero, the risk of surviving is one minus zero, or one. The last column is a cumulative survival at time t, also known as the Kaplan-Meier estimate, ST, which is obtained by multiplying all previous survival risks together. For time zero, ST is one or 100%. Nobody has died yet. So what happens at time T equals to six years? All 21 people enrolled in the study were still alive a millisecond before six years, and then three people died. At time T equals six, therefore, 
The number of people at risk is 21. The number of events or deaths is three. The risk of death at that time point is three divided by 21, which equals one, which equals 0.1429. The risk of not dying is one minus 0.1429, which equals 0.8571. And the cumulative risk of surviving is one times 0.8571, which is 0.8571, or about 86%. Now, let's consider what happens at time t equals to 7 years. This is where we need to take censoring into account because we had one person who survived until 6 years, but then was censored. So at time t is equal to 7 years, the number of people left in the study who are still at risk is the original enrollment, 21 people, minus the 3 people who died at 6 years, minus the one person who was censored after six years, which leaves 17 people. Of those 17 at risk, one person died. So at time t equals to seven, therefore, the number of people at risk is 17, the number of events is one, the risk of death at that point is one divided by 17, the risk of not dying is one minus 0 0.0588, which is 0.9412, and the cumulative risk of surviving is 1 times 0.8571 times 0.9412, which is equal to 0.8067, or about 81%. We can continue, continue similarly for all the other times. At time t equals to 10 years, the number of people at risk is the 17 who were at risk at the previous time, t equals 7, minus the 1 who died at the previous time, which gives 16 people. The number of events, deaths, is 1. The risk of death at that time point is 1 divided by 16, 0 0.0625. The risk of not dying is 1 minus 0 0.0625. And the cumulative risk of surviving is 1 times 0 0.8571 times 0 0.9412 times 0 0.9375 which is about 0.7563, or about 76%. At time t is equal to 11 years, the number of people at risk is the 16 who were at risk at the previous time, t is equal to 0, minus the one who died at the previous time, which gives 15 people. The number of events deaths is 0. Nobody died, but one person was censored. The risk of death at that time point is 0 divided by 15, which equals 0, the risk of not dying is 1 minus 0, and the cumulative risk of surviving is 1 times 0.8571 times 0.9412 times 0.9375 times 1, which is still 0.7563. Note that at times when only censoring occurs, the cumulative survival stays the same. The cumulative survival only drops at times when death occurs. At time t is equal to 13 years, the number of people at risk is the 15 who were at risk at the previous time, t equals 11, minus the one who was censored at the previous time, which gives 14 people. The number of events, deaths, is 2. The risk of death at that time point is 2 divided by 14, which is equal to 0.1429. The risk of not dying is 1 minus 0.1429, which equals 0.8571. And the cumulative risk of surviving is 1 times 0 0.8571 times 0 0.9412 times 0 0.9375 times 1 times 0 0.8571, which is 0 0.6482, or about 65%. Let's stop here and see what this plot looks like. A survival plot has the events time t on the horizontal axes and the cumulative survival, S of t, on the vertical axes. The survival curve for our example so far is shown above. At time zero, the cumulative survival is 100%. The cumulative survival drops at every time point where an event, a death, occurred, and the drop is larger if more people died and smaller if fewer people died. As our calculations on the previous slide show, the cumulative survival drops to about 86% at six years when three people died, 
and then to about 81% at 7 years when one person died, then to about 76% at 10 years when one person died, and finally to about 65% at 13 years when two people died. It would continue dropping at each event time after that if we continued and completed our survival table and plot. The locations of censored observations are marked on the plot above with open gray circles. There was one censored observation at 6 years and another censored observation at 11 years. The cumulative survival dropped steeply at 6 years because 3 people died at that time. However, it does not drop at all at 11 years because there were no deaths at that time, just the one censored observation. In our example, the estimated 5 year survival is 100%, but the estimated 10 year survival is 75.6%. The median survival time, which is defined as the cumulative survival when the, when the cum, blah, 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 when the cumulative survival drops to 50%, hasn't been reached yet in our data analysis, but is greater than 13 years. What would happen if this clinical study were repeated? Would we expect the survival curve to precisely match the one we obtained in this study? No. We likely would see slightly different we would likely see slight differences in survival because the patients in the new study would be different than the patients in this study. How much different would the survival be at any given time? This is typically conveyed by plotting confidence intervals for the survival curve. St statistical software packages will do this for you. An example of survival curves with confidence intervals based on a study of acute myeloid leukemia is shown above. The blue line is the survival curve for participants receiving treatment B, with the blue vertical lines indicating the censored observations, while the gold line and gold vertical lines are for participants receiving treatment A. The 500-day survival for those treated with A is about 55%, with a confidence interval from about 53% to about 63%, compared to about 70% with a confidence interval from about 65% to about 75% for the group receiving treatment B. The fact that the 500-day survival is higher in treatment group B than in treatment group A suggests that treatment B might be more effective. However, the confidence intervals for the two curves do overlap. Suggest However, the fact that the confidence intervals for the two, gra the two curves overlap often may indicate that the true treatments do not differ statistically. The width of a confidence interval is related to the number of people enrolled in the study. A larger study will give survival curves with narrower confidence intervals. The fact that the two survival curves for the study shown above overlap each other may indicate that the study was relatively small. A larger study would have narrower confidence intervals and might have allowed a difference between the two groups, if there really was one, to be more easily seen. The assumptions required for survival analysis are listed above. The first two should look familiar from earlier classes. The sample should be random, or at least representative, and the observations should be independent of one another. The remaining assumptions are specific to survival analysis. The criteria for participants to enter the study should remain consistent over time. The start time, time zero, for the study should be clearly defined. The endpoint or event of interest for the study must be clearly defined and remain consistent throughout the study. For example, death from cardiovascular disease. Any censoring should be unrelated to the outcome of interest. And finally, the average survival should remain constant throughout the study.